Guys, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Uh, If you're tuning in, make sure you guys like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know what you think about that episode. Uh, Today, again, I brought you guys another special guest. Uh, My friend Roman himself has a podcast. And um, very interesting that now it's a new uh, type of topic. I feel like he's been immersed more in the wrestling world, more in the fighter world, more in the athletic world. But um, also in the way that we think like psychologically i would say because i think that's a whole nother battle that you fight whenever you're trying to become a top tier level athlete and right before this we were talking a little bit about um, what it actually would take to become a top tier athlete and how i mean not to get anyone's hopes down but it's the one percent of the one percent so Hey, let's just right hop in right into that episode because that fact kind of threw me off. Roman, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for for having me on. And man, this this setup you got here as a, someone that has a podcast, I am peanut butter and jealous about your setup because this is like you're doing it in here. Very thank inspiring. You, Very inspiring. No, no, thank you. And what what is your podcast kind of surround of? Like, let's just start it off there. Yeah, so uh, I started roaming around in, I believe, 2019. Um, and it was really just a... Uh, it was just a way for me to start documenting my life and the people that I'm meeting and uh, and all the connections I was making. And throughout my, my life, and I'm, we're probably going to get into it, I've... I've always had an interesting story with uh, wrestling all my life, going in from going into D1 wrestling, going into NASCAR tire changing, starting the podcast, um, everything like that. And so I've always shared my story uh, thousands of times. And so I wanted to get a place where other people can share their story, Uh, a platform where other people can uh, interact with me, uh, share their story, their message, what they're up to. Uh, what it looked like, trials and tribulations, like how you got to be where you're at now. Um, and just so that other people can hear it from, uh, hear other people's journeys and in hopes that one listener can can uh, really just adhere to what that guest is saying and um, really just connect connect people. And so I'm a connector and a networker by heart. I just love uh, love connecting people and the podcast was just an easy route to do that after uh, meeting so many wonderful people in Charlotte and uh, with the goal of roaming around the world and doing different experiences, meeting everybody, meeting new people and uh, sharing more stories. So do you feel like you were always like a natural extrovert to where you say like you're a connector and so whenever you met people, you were just like, like you guys hit it off as easily or how would you say that you are when you were growing up? Oh man, I, I, Boiled it down to the moment. I know exactly when I became the person that, like that uh, empathetical person and that, like, so it was, um, it was probably around second grade, second or third grade and I was wrestling. And I always had like, um, we're gonna get into the mental stuff part about sports, but the hardest part about sports for me was losing. Like I could not lose well. Like if I like if I lost, I was bawling and I'd run off the mat and I'd find a find a locker room or behind the bleachers and I couldn't keep my composure. Um, and so one day I beat this kid, and he he did what I do and he ran off running and started crying. But he didn't find a secluded place to do it. He just kind of did it where people could see him. And then my dad was like, "You should go talk to him and go talk to that kid and just like let him know." And I was like, "Okay." And so I went up and talked to him and I don't remember the conversation, but I remember him. I do remember him wiping up his tears real quick and sniffling up a little bit and catching, catching uh, like his posture again. And then we had a conversation and again, second or third grade, I don't know what was said, but, but I noticed that like that we connected and we engaged and then, um, and it kind of helped him. And I, and then I, like years later, I was thinking, I was like, man, if one, if someone that beat me came up to me and, and asked me a question, like right after if I was crying and stuff, like it probably would have helped me be less of a sore loser 
because like just that one interaction him the fact that he he wiped up his tears and gained his posture again and just had a conversation with me after i beat him was like one point where i was like man that's like a the the impact of that one conversation probably i don't know what it impacted him but it definitely impacted me and then and then after that it was just like i just remember not being afraid to have any conversations with anybody the 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 fact that your dad pushed you to that was was wild especially because my dad is more the introvert my oh. my mom is the extrovert my mom will have a conversation with anybody okay she'll have a 15 minute conversation with the the teller at the register you know like that's her yeah my dad not so much and so my dad to see that and call that out and to, and to kind of just encourage me to do that was massive but what encouraged you to change, uh, kind of feeling empathetic for him, the fact that he had the strength to pick himself back up? Or what exactly did you empathize with with him? Um, I just kind of shared that, like, it's like I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, I remember those conversations were always just like, how long have you wrestled? Like, I mean, it's like little kid stuff. And so it was just like, um, and so by having that little bit of conversation and being able to connect, it was always, it was like, maybe I was a year more advanced than him. Maybe I was a year older than him because age groups, it's always like seven and eight year olds. And so the eight year old is always older than the seven. And so you're, you might be wrestling somebody a little bit older than you. That matters a lot in wrestling too, right? It definitely can. Yeah. The age can definitely play a part. Um, experience plays way more part than just age. I mean, you can have a 10 year old wrestle on a six year old, but if the six year old has more experience then he might still be the 10 year old. Okay. Um, and so it's not really age is one thing, but age just allows you to get more experience. Okay. Um, and, and so just by like, even, um, sharing things like that, it's like, you can kind of feel like, say I was, a year older than him and I've been wrestling maybe two years more than him. And then now that he knows that he might not be as upset because he's like, Oh, now I'm on the right path. You know, it's like, maybe I can be as good as him in a year okay. or maybe I can like, or something like that. And so there's always these like, um, as far as sports and stuff, there's so many different nooks and crannies we can like leak, we can go down. But, um, but yeah, it was just like, um, just hearing, uh, shared experiences from each other and what what I was doing to win what he was doing to win things like that can always just kind of help out and it's just good to have a friend in like because wrestling is a lonely sport and so it doesn't matter if it's like you go on that mat and it's only you and so it's nice to have a friend on other teams and stuff you can just bounce ideas off and just talk with to be honest oh man okay well that perspective changed you did that perspective also change the way you looked at losing then whenever you were did that go across were you a sore loser in every sport? <laughs> um, or, or just you just good took, question. That's just a good took, question. You just took loss. Um, football, I wasn't as sore because I could blame other people. You know, it's like it, okay, yeah, it's like I mean, if I was on defense and and say we lost because we couldn't score on offense, and it, then it wasn't as much on me. You know, yeah. And the loss gets the loss almost gets. Don't get me wrong, losing hurts, but the loss almost gets spread out around the whole team instead of it just on your back. Like if like on wrestling, if you lose in that match, that other guy, you watch the other guy's hand get raised. And and then and you're just sitting there and you know your your hand didn't get raised and so it's like you there's so much more to, to look into when you lose in, in wrestling, but I didn't like losing in anything. I mean, I was I <laughs> when I was a kid, I was crying losing playing cards losing playing phase 10 with my dad and my brother do you think because you had a lot of anger too that you hadn't suppressed or you hadn't learned how to manage because you you did say that you're like i was didn't manage it right well i i mean i wasn't i, I when i was when i get emotional it wasn't an anger emotion like okay. it was just like because like i mean Especially like once I got older too, like it wasn't, I wasn't upset. Like I wasn't mad that this other human beat me because okay. like, because what, so, okay. So yeah, let me bring this back. What wrestling does when you lose is it shows you what you didn't do. It shows you what work you didn't do. You remember all the times. It's like, you don't remember if you lose, you don't remember all the really hard workouts that you did. You remember the ones where you didn't give your all you didn't put all the effort in or or you cut a corner 
if you cut any corners in that, those are the first thing that pop up. Okay. It's not it's not the hard work you put in because everybody knows that you put in hard work. But then it's like you go back and you just reflect on all the all the places where you could have gotten better but you didn't. Or could have gotten better, or could have given a little more, but you didn't. Or you packed it in and mailed it in a little bit early. Those are what come up when you lose in wrestling. And so it's more of just like a, if you're looking in a mirror. I'm not looking at the other team. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at myself, and I'm like, damn, what did I do to lose that? Because it's like I didn't do enough to win, so yeah. I did enough to lose. And so then it's like, okay. And so then you go back to the drawing board and kind of see where, where I can make up for that. Those little increments that. I didn't have in that match. And I don't know about your streak, but whenever you kept on losing, what would you take it as then? Like, would you go, would you remind yourself of your losses? How do you keep up that consistency to say, go hard all the time in order to avoid those type of losses? Mm. You got to have a short memory. I mean, you can't because it's like golf. I, and I and I like golf because golf is a very, it's a very physical sport, but it's so mental because the physical part, I mean, the physical part is only the swing. Mm-hmm. And so you're only doing the physical part for maybe five seconds, and then and then there's that whole mental part where you have to walk to find your ball, think about the next shot, think about everything like that, and so you can't take your last horrible shot and bring it to your next shot. I can't take my last loss and bring it to my next match. Because if I'm thinking about that loss, when I'm not present with this match, then, then, I, then there's no way I'm winning. And so I got to have this, the, like, take, what, take the little bits that I can, maybe watch the film once. And you got to think, a lot of this is in a tournament atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So if I go in, say, first round and I lose, I got another match in, say, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And so it's like there's not much time to go in there and critique myself. I can't watch the match back five times and find everything that I did wrong. There's, there's just it's really just finding maybe those little bits that I could have did better, and then refocusing my brain on the next match. Because there's not much time in that thirty minutes to an hour where I'm gonna get better and fix everything in that match. Okay. And so then it's really just like okay, let me just. Sometimes it's, I'm gonna forget about that match and I'm gonna just go get ready for the next one. And then I'll worry about what I did wrong with that on Monday when I'm watching film and and like worrying working on my technique and stuff. But um, but yeah, it's hard. Like it's hard mentally. I mean, you gotta just like especially like uh, as you go through the tournament because like if you're just winning, it's easy. If you're just winning, like f- like quarterfinals, semifinals, going in the finals, it's like you're just on a roll. Mm-hmm. And then say you lose in the semifinals and you drop down. Now you got somebody that's coming off a win. You're coming off a loss. They're coming off a win. They might be coming off a string of wins. And so then they got momentum and you just you just lost when you're on your way to the finals. And so now you have this big chunk where you gotta you gotta figure out like how bad you want it. This other guy's coming in hot mm-hmm. and you just gotta like goldfish brain. Forget that last match. Go get ready for this one. In tournament settings, you also see you also get to see a lot of other people lose. Do mm-hmm. you ever learn something from other people's losses in in their technique, what they could have gotten better? Do you take like little bits and pieces in those moments to where like you can put it forward in your next match? So sometimes it's hard when. Um, because every wrestler is different. And so, like, if I watch just two random wrestlers wrestle, I might not see anything that works for me. Okay. And so, and, like, I can, like, take little bits and stuff, maybe some moves, some techniques and stuff. But, um, but like, and so I'll watch a match intentionally to try to break it down and try to figure it out, try to see what they're doing. Um, but as far as someone losing, I never really focused on, like, how this person loses, like, or like their reaction to losing or anything like that. Um, I always like, obviously they had less points than the other guy or something like that. And so I can see the technique and, um, the actual like tangible side of it, but I never really focused on like what this person like looks like when they're losing or things like that. Like I've like, even though I maybe have should, but, but yeah, just never, never focus on that part too much. And explain to me a little bit, because like people that haven't watched wrestling when in a tournament setting, mm-hmm. 
what, what are what are where do you get the points from where do you is is it based off moves too that you get points on because karate and all those are like whenever you hit the floor right whenever you hit the mat that's yeah i'm, I'm not too sure about karate to be honest but wrestling is like it's positional it's like positional, if, yeah. if you start everyone starts on their feet face to face if i take you down and i get on top of you and i get your back where you have three points of contact whether that be your knees hand something like that your head your your knees if you go down to the mat and i'm on top of you i get two points if you have three points of contact yeah including the knee it can't just be or actually i think it it's been a while since i've refed or anything like that but i believe it's three points of contact okay. and so if i'm if, if i'm behind you and you even have your hand down i think i i get two don't quote me on that. And it may be different in college and stuff. It's been a while, but, okay. but yeah. And then, so takedowns are big. Uh, reversals, if you're on top of me and then I get on top of you, that's two points. If you're on top of me and I get out and get back up to my feet, that's a point. And so it's all just like a positional battle. If you put me to my back and break, break 90 degrees, you'll start getting back points. If you get both my shoulder blades to the mat at one point in time for a split second, it's a pin. That's when the match is over. And so that's both the big of, one. Both of them would have to be on there. And yeah. do you wrestle for like a certain amount of time or is it until the point, like let's say you get to 15 points, you're done. How, how does it? Yep. So um, there's in college, there's three two minute periods. So three, two minutes, six yep. minutes. In. Yep. Six minutes uh, with a one minute overtime. And then um, that's if y'all are tied. Yep. Okay. Um, point. Well, you can win by points. Obviously, if you have more points than him, um, if you. If you are winning by 15 or more points, the matches are automatically over. So if you're in the second period and there's a minute left and you got and you score a takedown and it puts you up 17 to two, then the match is over. Uh, um, or if you put their shoulder blades on the mat, match is over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you started out. You said whenever you were about six years old, second, mm -hmm. third grade level. How did that, did the skill level transition? Because you got to the level of college D1, like every single time, like what did you have to keep on changing? Like, is it the physical aspect? Mm -hmm. Is it, do you have to play like mental games with yourself? Like what's, what's kind of like both of those perspectives? Like, well, let's start off with the physical. Yeah. So obviously there's a huge physical change from say, six to 18 or and then and so um there's different physical changes from say even say from wrestling in elementary school to then wrestling in middle school to then wrestling in high school to then wrestling in college there's gonna be those physical changes where the biggest leap is college or high school to college okay. that one and that one is it's strategically buffered by a red shirt year in college where um essentially if you're a d1 athlete not at an Ivy League school, you have five years to compete. Four years of eligibility and then one redshirt year. The redshirt year is where you can um, essentially work out with the team. You can go to like random open tournaments and stuff, but you're not officially, like you're not wearing the singlet. You're not wearing the college on your chest. Oh, really? Yeah. Why do they do that? Just to give you a perspective into it? It gives you a year to, um, to just feel the changes of from high school to college wrestling and it's also like a buffer year like you don't have to do it your first year okay you could do it like your third year or something like oh, that. oh it doesn't or, matter and then there's injury red shirts too if you get injured you can red shirt as well um and so there's a couple things like that but a lot of times it's like people going from high school to college will take that red shirt year first just so that they can get one year in the room to just feel it out and see and just like see the new level and then start wrestling the next the next year <laughs> for you what was the new level like oh i mean it's and it's like this for everybody i mean you go into this college room and then you're it's like you're wrestling from going literally wrestling from high schoolers to wrestling grown men and so it's like you'll go the first five months without scoring a takedown like you just won't even score a takedown on these guys because they're just like that much ahead of you and, it, and it's like and not only again it's like when you're in your high school room uh like we mentioned, the 1%, if you wrestle in college, you're part of the 1%. When you're in the high school room, your workout partners and the, the people around you aren't all in the 1%. Oh, 
all the whole like and so like you're working out with a partner who might be in the 75th percent or like or work might be in the top 20 percent even if he's tough too you know Damn. but once you get to the college room everyone you wrestle is in the top one percent because they all went to college yeah so it's you don't have any scrubs in the college room it's Damn. like yeah and so then it's like the one percent fighting the one percent and then it's just you're knocking heads every day just to try to get a point but what do you do to try to get to their level? Like, do you try to gain weight? Like, is it is wrestling a strength um, game? Is it a skill game? What essentially plays out? Because I don't really know how wrestlers work out. What yeah. do wrestlers work out in? I know it's physical. Like, let's say I wrestle someone, like, really try to take them down. Mm -hmm. In a minute, I'm gassed. Yeah. 30 seconds? why is that though like because you're exerting yeah why yeah. why does one get tired there's a couple there's a couple of different levels to it um there's a there's a big mma fighter retired now but uh george st pierre uh -huh. gsp he talks about this a lot he talks about efficiency and shape like if you're efficient he says that if you can be efficient it doesn't matter what shape you're in and it's and and I'm starting to see it now as I'm starting to do all these other martial arts. But um, if you can get if if you can make somebody uncomfortable and make somebody feel like they don't know what to do or make somebody always constantly reacting, then that's like gonna slowly. I, I like to think of it like a health bar, like a video game, like Street Fighter, <laughs> okay. literally. Yeah. And so I'm gonna and so like there's there's this like amount of where I want to make you work. Like if I'm gonna put my hands on you, I want to move you to where you don't want to be. So that you're shuffling, you're scrambling sometimes. Like you're, you want to place your foot here, but once I pull you, your foot's going over here, and now you're not having the foot placement that you want. And so those little bits start adding up because now it's like he's starting to react. He's starting to, like, like again, and it's a full body, full body movements too. So it's not like you're just like upper body only or just like just using your arms and stuff. It's like full body movements. And so strength wise, you got to be in good shape. You got to be in good good shape with good endurance. Um, six minutes, seven minutes, not too long of a time, but it's seven minutes full, full blow, like full go. Like it's because it's full body and everything, and you have another person trying to impose their will on you. And so you have to impose your will on them before they impose on you. Whenever you say efficiency, it means like unbalancing or throwing your opponent off his game yep and just like yeah like that's a big one of it like i see well let me even me as an example i've been doing jujitsu recently for the past couple months like not very long yeah i don't really know what i'm doing in jujitsu very much but i but my wrestling takes me a decent way like okay because of my 25 years on the mat i have a decent role but there's still places where i'm just like i don't know what to do like in jujitsu you're you're allowed to lay on your back yeah, is and, that, that's how you start off, no? Like, um, you start off like... Or you start off on your feet, but then it's like most of the time it gets to one guy on their back pretty quickly. Okay. But I'm not used to wrestling on my back because when I go to my back, I'm pinned in wrestling. Yeah. And so when, when I'm trying to wrestle on my back and stuff, I'm just so uncomfortable there that like because I'm uncomfortable, because I'm in a situation that I don't really know the answer to, it makes me inefficient. Because I'm reaching for something that I don't really know what to grab. The uh, top person is maybe setting me up and maybe like uh, create some traps and stuff for me. And I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> you know, you know? and so if, if, if you don't know like the next move or the next sequence or like how to get out of a certain position, you start almost kind of panicking. Like a slight, not like a full on panic, but just a, a little panic in the head that's like, ah, I got to get out of here. Or I got to get back to my home space. Like I got to get back to somewhere where I'm comfortable. And so the longer you can keep that person in that uncomfortable state, mm -hmm. the, the more their health meter is going to go down. The more they're going to, the more energy they're starting to expend because they, they're not in comfortable territory. They're in unknown territory. And if you can put someone in unknown territory where it's like, I haven't been here in the gym. I don't know what this feels like. It's like, um, Shoot, I mean, even one of the last big fights, Israel Adesanya and Sean Strickland. I mean, 
Izzy looked so uncomfortable that whole fight because he was so used to guys that were biting on his fakes and stuff like that, that when he finally had somebody that was going to walk him down, not bite on any fakes and things like that, he didn't know what to do. He just kind of crumbled and, and was kind of just like his whole strategy was gone. And so, yeah, that's kind of the efficiency part is definitely something that like it's both physical and mental. Because like it's about knowing the techniques, that being able to implement the techniques, and then it's physically being able to implement the techniques while your opponent is trying to impose his will on you. Dang, I had never looked at <laughs> never looked at wrestling or kind of like fighting like that. But you know, it's like if you don't have a strategy, then you really don't know what what you're going into. Mm -hmm. And the mental strain at the end, you compared it a little bit to golf. It's like. It just keeps on getting depleting. Like your muscles don't know how to react. Like it's... yeah, um, at a certain point you want like you want your game plan to be like f to be like stapled in so that you're not thinking out there, so that you're just kind of reacting mm -hmm. and just going with it. Um, but there's like MMA is such a puzzle. Like I'm I'm really like enjoying like the puzzle of MMA because. Um, because there's so many different techniques, uh, so many different arts, so many different levels, kickboxing, Muay Thai, straight boxing, uh, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, uh, like karate, you name it. I mean, there's so many different levels to it that there's almost like so much you have to worry about. But if you focus on everything you have to worry about, then you're not focused on your game plan. And so that's kind of like the both sides of it. Because <laughs> like they can... Th throw everything out at they can throw the whole kitchen sink out at you but if you can focus on your game plan then the amount of reactions you're going to get are going to be less than if you just didn't have a game plan because going back to wrestling you said that size didn't matter then I, i've seen tall big weight guys get knocked down by someone sh short with yeah. technique uh, well, in wrestling, there's always weight classes too. And okay. so like you are going to face people in your weight class. But I mean, I'm a testament to myself where it was like, I was in high school. I was a tiny kid. I wrestled 103 my freshman year. I mean, I was. I 103? Was, yeah, I was tiny, Damn. man. But like. Dude, you were come, pa a little uh, bit past 100 pounds. I know. I was light. Yeah. Um, at 14. Yep. 103 at 14. And then. Um, but I mean. And then homecoming comes, and then everybody wants to wrestle me in, and so it's like I'm wrestling the <laughs> the the starting running back and all these other guys, and it's just like, and so then yeah, it's like the one hundred three, the one hundred three pound guy takes out the running back, you know? It's, really? <laughs> yeah, it's and awesome. so it's and that's where the technique part comes in because it's like those football guys aren't efficient on the mat; they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. They're heavy stepping, flat footed, like like because football is completely different. You got to stand your ground. Yeah, shoot, I'm trying to make you move. Yep, and then once I pull you and you make you move in certain ways, they're just falling over themselves. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, man. And what kind of – you got to the level of D1. Again, let's go back to it. What made – like what kind of told you, like, I can't pursue this as a career? I can't keep this as a career-wise? Yeah, I mean – when, if you're not winning national titles and stuff in college, the Olympics and stuff are just kind of they're not they're not in the same ballpark. They they just those goals were just not there for me. Um, like you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, it's like the top one percent wrestles in college, and then the Olympics is the top one percent of those people. And so like. Um, there's maybe only 30 guys that are competing for one of 10 spots on the Olympic ladder. There's, there might be more. I might, I might not know the numbers very well, but most of those guys are national champs. They're all NCAA all Americans, things like that. And just having a realistic, realistic kind of vision of my, myself, my career and things like that. It's just like, that's just not, I'm not that high of a level of wrestling where it needs to be. And so uh, there wasn't much push for um, trying to be on the world team or anything like that. I was just being just being realistic. I mean, I was losing to guys that I shouldn't be losing to that did an All-American. And so when you throw All-Americans and stuff on there, and I've got my ass kicked in college, too, by some guys that 
weren't weren't making it to the world team and stuff and so it's it's more of just like a, it's good to watch i'll watch those and be like because <laughs> it's always cool to just be like damn I, I wrestled a world team member or i mean i like even it's like i look back and uh in like was it eighth grade mm-hmm. i went one and one with a who uh, with a guy named james green who's a who ended up winning worlds and so it was kind of cool to like to see that, but it's like, I don't see myself going out there and winning worlds or anything like that, but it was just cool being around those people and, um, and seeing that because, I mean, I had a kid named Zeke who won, who got second at NCAAs after living on my couch and he was a true freshman in college and I was a senior. Were you training him? Um, well, we were on the same team and so, but he was 125 and so he was a small guy, um, but we would warm up and we would roll around every once in a while. But I wasn't really, I wouldn't say I was training him. We had college coaches that are definitely in there for that. But, um, but yeah, I saw him take it to these guys and shock the world and win four, five matches in a row to get to the finals. And then he ended up losing the finals. But he did, he made a damn cool run and it was fun to watch on my couch. Now that you are a coach. Mm hmm. How much did coaches play out into how successful you are? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, the coach is going to prepare you for battle. But the coach can't go out there and wrestle for you. It's like Belichick ain't throwing those balls. Tom Brady was throwing those balls kind of thing. And so the coach can get you prepared. The coach can get you ready. But again, it's like win or lose, you're looking at yourself on what work you put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, the coaching definitely matters. A good coaching staff that you're confident in, that you can trust in. And, that, and when you put your trust into the coaches, that's where uh, the coach and the, and the relationship really goes on. Because if you have a coach that you don't trust and he's telling you to do something and you're – and if you don't trust them, you're not, you're probably not putting all your effort into it. You're probably not like, if he says, if you like, yeah, if he has a coach, if you have a coach that you don't trust that says, you're going to go run that hill 10 times. And, and if you don't make it in 45 seconds, you're gonna have to do it again type deal. Someone might hear that and be like, man, fuck this hill. Like I ain't going to do this 10 times. Oh, yeah. It's like, especially if they don't trust their coach, if they're like, oh man, the coach is just trying to punish me or something. Yeah. But the coach knows like maybe the coach in the back of his head, I mean, I had an Olympic silver medalist coach who fucking sparked a light, sparked a fire under me my senior year, and so if he would have told me to do anything, I would have, I would have fucking did it because. But, but what did his credentials give him more credibility to what he could told you to, to do, or did his way of teaching you give way into how much respect you had into him? A little bit of both, because the credentials are obviously there. If you have an Olympic silver medalist telling you to do something, you're not going to say no. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I mean, he put me in a position. He put me in a tough position, too, because I say I wrestled 157 in college my senior year. And so I was, I was weighing like 175, 170, 175, and then I cut down to 157. Mm -hmm. So then he asked me, our 49-pounder got hurt, and he was like, you got two and a half weeks to make 49. Okay, so l let me go off that. Yeah. Okay, again, crazy, right? But how do you lose that much weight? What do you start doing? Do you start eating less? Let, let's let's keep on the the coach story, okay. and then um, and so he told me to go down to forty nine, and I was like, Coach, I don't want to do this. And he was like, We need you, Roman. Like he's like, We need you. And so at that point, it's like, I'm listening to every word he says. And at that point, I got a nutritionist. I got everything, and I was just like, Boom, boom, boom. And so I put so much trust in him because. Not because I like, I mean, not because I knew him, but mostly because of his credentials. I mean, when, when he got hired, I knew that I had probably six months to make it, to work with him, to make a name for myself. That was, pro that was probably how much I had time because this was going into my fifth year. Um, and then I was going to be graduating. And so this was like my last shot. And so I was like, everybody I was listening to beforehand really didn't do much for me. And, um, and I, I didn't really make a name for myself previously. And I was getting hurt. I was getting in trouble. And so this, I was like, this is my last chance. So then once he got hired, I was like, 
I was like, fuck it, let's go. And, and then also he was like, and he gained a lot of respect from us because he walked in one day and was like, I remember like it was yesterday. He was he, he we had a hard practice and then I don't know if we actually gave it. Like, we actually went as hard as he thought. And so at the end, he was like, how many of y'all actually like wrestling? And he was like, how many in here like wrestling? And not many hands went up. And then he was like, you think I like wrestling? He goes, I would rather be drunk at a basketball game than in here wrestling. But he goes, do you know what's better than wrestling? Getting your hand raised. Back to the, back to getting your hand raised. And so that's, that's when it was just like, okay. And so that, And then that brought it back to me where it was just like, I mean, at that point, I'd been wrestling for 20 years. Uh, maybe, maybe, let's just say 18, 20 years or so. And I knew that I had just like one year left. It was like, I'm going to do whatever this guy says to get there. And so then... He probably yeah. sparked that childhood memory on like, that's what you love. Literally. Yeah. Like once he said that, and, and, and he was just truthful. I mean, like, because you have a lot of coaches that will blow smoke up. But he was just like, I'm not in this. He's like, because he used to say like... If I get fired, I'm going to go mow. I'm gonna, he goes, I'm going to get a riding lawnmower, and I'll be just mowing lawns and drinking beer. He's like, I don't care. He's like, I'm going to probably do that either way. <laughs> and so he's like, if y'all don't want to listen to me, I'll go mow lawns and drink beer. But he goes, I promise you, if you listen to me, we're going to make some shit happen. And so then at that point, you just got nothing. There ain't nothing that a 23-year-old, I was like, fuck it. You're my man. I'm your man. That, and so that genuineness like touches your heart like, fuck yeah like, where'd this like, guy come from yeah i mean uh he's still he still lights a fire under me but but yeah he uh yeah i was glad because i was going to graduate without staying my fifth year and okay. then my coach was getting the boot and then there was like three coaches that were up for grabs and the day he got hired was the day i i called my dad and called everybody and was like i'm staying for another year okay yeah and, and what um how'd that fifth year change you like you knowing you gave it your all yeah i mean he and that and like i mean he knows how committed i was he like calls me like the fucking i was like the the team player like that because especially dropping that weight and so like uh we had we had a good season and then again i had to cut down from 57 to 49 to 57 i got a nutritionist or from 57 to 49 i got a nutritionist i was seeing every day I worked freaking nonstop for, like, I mean, I wasn't really going to classes anymore at that point. I was like, I couldn't even call my family anymore. Like, I, like, this was like, because I had probably a month left in wrestling. And, and, uh, I mean, going from 57 to 49 was like making myself a 10 pound smaller person in two weeks. And so it wasn't, I didn't have any fat on my body. It was just like, because I thought I was, I thought I was sucked out at 57. Yeah. And then I still had, eight more pounds and so um yeah it was just a lot of hard work and even when i would call my family and tell them they were like you don't have to do this like you don't have to listen to your coach and stuff and so then at one point i was just like i i can't call you guys anymore i was like you guys are trying to talk me out of doing something great and like and and if i didn't make the weight i wouldn't have been a big 12 finalist because you were doing it for yourself right mostly like you you were trying to prove it to yourself like that you could or you're trying to prove it to your coach too, like to like kind of hold that accountability. Well, when he put it to me and he was like, the team needs you. I need you. We need you. Then it was way bigger than me. And so it was just like, mm. yeah. Was, and so then that's when it was just like, I was just like, okay, whatever you say. And it was, it was funny. I mean, right after, typically right after weigh-ins, you're so hungry. I weighed in for 57 on the second day of this tournament, Virginia duels. And then I weighed in at 57 and he comes up to me and he goes, Roman, you're not wrestling today. You got two and a half weeks to cut down to 49. Damn, man, you were and ready so to eat. I was ready to eat, and I lost my, all my appetite, and I was just like, oh, eight more pounds, and I just kind of sat there. But then, yeah, but then the next week I got to work and made it happen, and yeah, won a couple matches, Big 12 finalist, and then, yeah, I got to uh, finish off my college career with, with that Big 12 finalist run, and yeah, it wouldn't have happened if I didn't, if I didn't, if I took the easy way out. Let's just say that. Damn. Do you think that plays out in your life every day? Like that lesson? Like that you're capable of doing much more than you think? Or you're not always giving it your all? 
Because you know they say like, let's say I can kid myself that I'm going to the gym, right? And then I'm going all in. When in fact, we've set the speed limit at 60 whenever our speed limit is yeah, 200. Yeah, you hit your governor. So it's like... Are we governing ourselves correctly? I don't think so to the max, not all the time. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's something that good coaches, and that's that's where I think you even need a coach. Some people like to do things on their own and stuff, but the coach is like someone that's going to tell you that what you're doing isn't going to help you succeed. What you're doing right now isn't enough kind of deal. Or, or like, and they're going to tell you, and they're going to be brutally honest and things like that, and so like, um, it definitely plays out, and like because I, I wouldn't have forced myself to go down to forty nine, and I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't have done that myself, and I and I wouldn't have, and then if I would have said no, I would have, I wouldn't have been a Big Twelve finalist, I probably wouldn't have gone to NASCAR, and so I, I do think that let that whole thing kind of changed the trajectory of my life because it was just like I think Sammy coming in changed my coach coming in was the trajectory changed just because it was just like. That's when, like, the path split where it was just, like, finishing college with nothing really planned. And then, like, okay, now I got another year. Boom. And then, like, everything just opened up after that where it was just, like, my strength coach got a call from the NASCAR recruiter. And when they were, like, who are you going to – got anybody to recommend for NASCAR? And he gave my name and then – Went off and did that for a couple years. Oh, so, so the fifth year actually played out a lot in your oh, life. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, the fifth year was... I mean, literally, I was going to leave the sport with a bad taste in my mouth. Damn. Yeah, and so like, and so then it was like, yeah, right when my coach got hired, I called everybody and was like, I'm staying. And then, yeah, it played out, played out very well. Because the mindset was like, just leave this shit, fuck it. And... Yeah, I mean, because I had been, I had been in and out of the lineup. I had been injured. I had been in trouble. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just like, and part of the injuries and the trouble made me think that I wasn't getting a fair shot at the lineup, getting a fair shot at a starting spot. And so, okay. Once the new coach came in, he didn't care about my previous trouble. He didn't care about my injuries and things like that. He was just like the best wrestler is going to wrestle. And so then it just was like, perfect. Now I get a fair shot. Now it's not like the last four years of me just just partying and and getting in trouble and things like that those aren't going to hold me back and so now i'm like okay let's see what's up on the mat and so then yeah sammy was just honest and open about it and that's it was kind of like a, a fresh restart awesome. for my senior year whenever you're cutting weight what goes through your mind like what's diet like Cause I, Cause I don't know wrestlers diet. Yeah. Like, do they try to stay like super, super lean, or they try to eat a lot of protein for muscle growth? Yeah, there's a lot to it. It's a it's a lot of discipline and consistency. It's almost like I mean, you ever heard someone? You ever heard anybody say eat like a dog? Eat the same thing every day. It's like just eat the same thing every day. You can't go wrong. It's like it's, it's so it's like a lot of times like I I have no problem meal prepping for myself and having the same meal every night for a week, you know. And it's like and I, and that, and that's how it was like in wrestling too. Like in high school, kids used to make fun of me because I would come in with a plastic bag. My my dad stopped giving me my, the Tupperware because I would just leave it in my locker yeah. and it would just get all like a science project. And so he just Ziploc bags full of fucking rice pasta and tilapia and things like that while all the other kids are eating pizza subs and stuff in the cafe with the pink trays and all that it was just like i cooked my own food and it's, and then i just i would just eat and i'd eat probably seven eight times a day seven to eight times a day but the very same small thing. very small meals but like uh most of my big meals were like the same thing like chicken and rice or pasta and tilapia uh a protein with a carb um and then just like scattering, like making them so that my metabolism never really stopped. And so then like that was like in high school and there's and over the years of experimenting, there's so many different ways that people go about cutting weight. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because like, I mean, I've made weight doing eight meals a day. I've made weight intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. only having one meal a day. I've made weight three square meals a day and and working out a lot. And so it's all about like just what works for you. And like finding out like 
like your routine and how you want to do it and just finding like little cheat codes in the in the way like like people don't understand that like meat meat processes in your body at different rates and so your red meat you want to have early in the week say i wrestle on saturday i competed on saturday and i don't compete until the next saturday so i got a week and so sunday i'm gonna have a steak Sun because the red meat's gonna take three to four days to process okay and so i'm gonna have that early in the week and then monday through wednesday maybe even monday through tuesday i'm gonna have chicken because the chicken process is in one or two to three days and then towards the end of the week thursday friday weigh in on saturday fish i moved to fish because fish will process less than a day Oh shit! and so then little cheats like that just kind of help you like okay so now this i'm having my protein this isn't going to stay in my body long this will be out before weigh in i don't have this red meat just kind of lingering around like like if you have a steak on friday it's going to be hard to get that 12 ounce off of you for saturday morning but that's how wrestlers mentality like that's how the wrestling diet plan kind of like makes you think right like three days ahead like I must still have this or four. Yeah. If you're, if you're really thinking about it, I mean, some people don't put that much thought into it and it wasn't like I had to put that much thought into it just because of the, how much weight I was losing and, and, um, like just because, I mean, I don't think every wrestler has to cut weight, but there's a, there's all, there's a fine line between like making decisions that are going to benefit you okay like um let's just say like if i have a wrestler right now who's in eighth grade let's just say he's in eighth grade and let's just say he hovers around 108 just 108 and so like he can wrestle 110 all day he wrestles he was 108 but he can also make small changes to his diet and stuff and wrestle 105 and maybe have a better chance at 105. And so that's where it's just a little bit of diet, a little bit of diet change. I know, you know, maybe get off the Oreos, maybe do that meat trick so that you have that, so that you're a little bit lighter towards the end of the week. Maybe skip a meal if you have to, maybe an extra workout the night before, something like that. And so it's, it all starts off with these little changes that can just maybe get you just a little ahead. Wow. Like, cause you might be a little bit stronger at 105 than you are at 110 and so that's kind of where it starts is like um yeah like because even some kids will just go weigh whatever they naturally weigh <laughs> and then they just go wrestle and it's like i'm like and i'm i'm happy for those kids do it like i mean because i'm not the i'm not the biggest like i don't think every wrestler should cut weight because i mean if i wasn't mentally strong I can see why it would, it could help, it could like push somebody towards like eating disorder type stuff. Yeah. Because like, I don't think I had any eating disorders, but I kind of had some uh, disorder tendencies, mm -hmm. you know, where it was like, I'm fucking hungry. It's 2 a.m. I want to run downstairs and grab a Pop Tart. And I did that a lot. And, and I paid for it by how much I ran and how much I worked out and oh, things like okay, that. Okay. And so it's funny. I told somebody this the other day where it was like, I won state in high school at 103 my freshman year mm -hmm. at 14. And I was weighing like 120. And so I was cutting like 15 to 17 pounds almost every week. Um, and I would cheat on my diet and I would run. And I tell everybody that like I knew I was in the best shape. I was in the best shape of anybody in the state tournament because of how much I cheated on my diet and how much I worked out. Like I knew it. I knew that like, it didn't like no one had ran more miles than me <laughs> because no one had ate more pop tarts than me kind of deal. And so, and so it was like a backhanded sword. It was like, I was doing damage to myself because I was putting more work on, on me, but I was also in the best shape of my life because I was r ready and willing to work off anything I needed to. And the sacrifice of like you eating something. Yeah. And like, and so, I mean, there were some times where I was really good with my diet and I wouldn't have to run as much, but there were times where like, yeah, I would just, I'd balloon up and then I'd just have to work it off. And so then it's like, I had zero, I was so confident in my shape that I didn't care how tired I got. Damn. I was just, and it was just so confident. It was just like, 
I mean, even in the finals, it was like I was down. I was losing until the third period in the last two minutes, and then I just kept and I kept working the guy, and then I ended up beating him by a point. Damn. Yeah, but but yeah, he was. Uh, and yeah, he and it was because he faded at the end. He was in good shape, but he wasn't in as good a shape as me. And so once he got tired in the third period, that's when I put it on him. Dang it. And you can see that from your opponent, huh? Like whenever they start like losing it or. Yeah. I mean, and you st- like, it's like body language is huge. You can see it. Like when you go out of bounds and then you're coming back in the middle, it's like if one guy runs in the middle and the other guy's slowly walking, that's just like body language. You can just tell. Or like how they look between periods or whether they're breathing through their nose or their mouth, like little things like that. You just kind of tell like, okay, like if they start mouth breathing, fucking put it on them, lay it on them, keep that pressure on because it's like they're only, you're already starting to breathe inefficiently. It's only a matter of time until everything starts going from there. So your experience in college really shaped you to how you coach then today, right? Like, cause we're going to skip the, like, uh, so you went from D1 wrestling after college, you did your fifth year. Mm -hmm. Then you got caught up to NASCAR. Were you happy in NASCAR? What did you do? Mm. So I was a front tire changer for Hendrick Motorsports. Mm -hmm. And I had a great time, man. I like it was it was like a last ditch effort to be an athlete again. And so like I didn't have a I had never seen a race on TV. I had uh, never been to a race. I didn't even have a car. And like, question, why do they call up wrestling? Like, why did they call up your wrestling camp? If, yeah, so it's, NASCAR? so their thoughts were it's easier to train a athlete to change tires fast than a mechanic to change tires fast. And that's so, how they that's, think? That, that was just their thought process was just like, we need this done for speed. If I get a mechanic to do it, I got to teach him how to be fast. But if I get a fast athlete, I can just teach him how to do the tech, do the task. Dang. Okay. And so then it was just like, I mean, I, like it wasn't just like wrestlers. It was football players, baseball players, all sports. They were, they were recruiting everywhere. I mean, we, my combine, it was like a vertical jump, bench press, agility drills, like a combine, like NFL combine. We did that at Hendrick with over a hundred athletes. And then they ended up hiring like seven. And I was one of the seven. Yeah. You're one of the seven. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. And so, um, and then it was just more about learning, learning the task. And uh, that had its whole own little psychology to it, too, because it's like you have a job to do and you have to do it to perfection. And then you also have to do it while you're uh, like in sync with your whole other team. And so, like, the jack man jacks the car up as the car comes up. I pull the tire out. As I pull the tire out, the other tire's coming in. As I, as my tire's out, I'm coming back in. I'm running them up. The other guy's grabbing the tires, bringing them all around, and then we do the same on the other side. And so Damn. it's all choreographed for speed, but there's definitely a little bit of a stay in your own lane while working with the team aspect. And so very different, but um, it was a unique experience for two and a half years. Do you guys practice that? Like – off the track yeah i mean that's what we were treated like athletes i mean we worked out every day and then we had practice like oh, and so yeah we would do like 10 pit stops a day or so um and then and then we'd have a hour hour 30 minute strength training session as well and then we would like practice with the other teams and see all the other teams practice and learn from the older guys and stuff like that so very much sport oriented they actually wouldn't even let me go to any other part of the organization like they wouldn't let me like try to find my way into marketing or learn more about the cars and stuff. They were like, no, nope, just change your tires <laughs> and be athletic enough to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Just be athletic. I mean, it was it like it was a uh, it was interesting. We we're kind of like the stepchild at some one point. But do you guys practice to speed up or do you guys practice to be fast enough and efficient? All three, I would say. I mean, it's always about speed. Um and so, and, and so it's like every, every person has their own opportunity to get faster by doing their own thing. And then everybody has an opportunity to get faster by working with the person that they're working with too. Oh, shit. And so that's where it's like, it's tough too, because like, like the, like the, ex, the tire exchange from me pulling the tire out mm-hmm. to then 
putting the tire, them putting the tire on, and then me coming back and hitting a lug nut before the other person can go. And so it's like that person's going to stand there, keep that tire in the well until I put a lug nut on. And so he's got to stand there. And the longer I make him wait, the longer it's going to take him to get everything around. And so I'm, I might slow him down. And so there's these, these aspects that make – it's like slow down to speed up. If you do your job right with no mistakes, you're good. But there's five lug nut – or there's only one lug nut nowadays. But when I did it, there was five. And so I got to hit each lug nut perfectly. If I say one, two, three, four, five, if I have to hit six because I missed one – that's time that I can't get back. Damn. It's not like I can go to the other side and hit four because I still got to hit five lug nuts off. But if I had hit six or seven, sometimes I, I blacked out and I'd hit 10. It's like, dun, 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 this one won't come off. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and things like that while I'm learning. And so, yeah, it's like uh, mastering your, it's mastering your, your task and then getting fast with your teammates. How long do you do that for? About two and a half years. Yeah. Two, two and a half. Yep. Then you uh, had a fun time with that. Then you went into like coach wrestling, wrestling coach. Yeah. Right when I got out of that, I was like, I got to get back to my roots. And okay. so it was like, let's get back on the mat. And so I found a amazing wrestling club called C2X, um, Commitment to Excellence, that I've uh, been with since 2017. And yeah, coaching kids. We got kids from 6 to 18, North and South Carolina. Uh, boys and girls, uh, freestyle, folk style, Greco, all three styles. I mean, we're doing some awesome stuff down there. And you as a coach, what's, <laughs> what do you bring from your perspective into coaching? Like, do you try to, how do you motivate your kids to try to be better athletes? Or do you even try to do that? Oh, I mean, I'd always try to do that. I mean, I, I mean, the one thing is just living it too. I mean, if I'm doing a practice with the kids, it's like I'm doing the warm up. I do the workout. I do the sprints. It's like if I can live it and make them work harder, it's like they're they're seeing their coach do. Like I would never make my athletes do something I never done. And okay. so by seeing me do it and seeing it me live it and things like that, it definitely helps them um, buy in a little bit more. Um, also, I I try to, and this is something that I like when I first because. When I first started coaching, I had a weekend job, and so I would coach them during the week, but then I wouldn't see them compete. And so I wasn't sitting in their corner when they were competing, which was tough for me. Okay. Because it was I was just a weekday coach, and then they'd go wrestle in these tournaments, and then I'd come back, and then on Monday, I'd be like, how'd you do? And then I'd just try to fix stuff, but I wasn't actually seeing them wrestle or being in their corner and things like that. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I started actually going to these tournaments and stuff and kind of seeing them compete and everything like that. And, and so I try to just, I try to give them like the, it's hard, it's hard in the moment, especially with kids, but the youth tournaments, especially like when they're like first through sixth grade, it's like, I try to tell not only the athletes, but the parents too, mostly the parents, I would say, because it's like, Sure, this tournament today means a lot. It means a lot to the kids. It means a lot to the parents. You know, it like it, it means a lot whether it's just a small tournament or the state tournament, youth state tournament, whatever. But it was just like this isn't. It means a lot today. It's going to mean a little less tomorrow. Five years down the road, you're not going to remember this tournament, and so it's like, and so then I just tell the kids, kids, go out there, just wrestle your heart out, compete. Don't worry about it's like don't get caught in your head, things like that. Parents, don't make this about you. Don't go out there, don't yell and yelling at your kids, things like that. Don't get them up, don't make them get upset. It's like this is just another tournament. And so it's like I try to relieve the pressure off the kids and stuff because it's like again, this tournament means a lot, but you're gonna wrestle in hundreds of tournaments. Like the amount of tournaments I wrestled in in youth, I mean it had to have been thousands. And and like the and and the maybe not thousands hundreds definitely hundreds i don't know if it'd be interesting to see i mean after all those years but <laughs> but yeah it's like when they mean a lot in the moment but it's just like these little tournaments don't mean much and so it's like if you can like wrap your try to wrap your head around like 
staying present and like kind of in the moment it's like you can get so much out of like what's actually happening right now instead of like trying to be the best like it's like because sometimes you know whether you're the best or not and like especially like there because when i was younger i had two kids jake and dallas who were my uh basically family i rode i rode with them everywhere their dad was my coach shout out to coach sam um and he took me everywhere and jake and dallas were a lot better than me at these tournaments and so they would go and win these tournaments and i'd go oh and two and Damn. but if i like but like if i took that to heart every time i went oh and two i might have not been the wrestler that i wanted to be today you know it might like if if i really like got butt hurt every time i went oh and two i probably would have quit but like just like but even like being around them and seeing what they're doing and seeing like okay it's like okay like i i know what I, I know what it takes. And so when you go to these tournaments and you, you have, say, 20 kids, you'll have, say, 10 that don't reach their goals, five that almost do, and maybe five that do. And hopefully the 15 that didn't reach their goals look at the five and see what they're doing during the week. Oh, okay. And see how they're training, and see okay they're practicing like this, and then, um, and then they can start kind of like learning by seeing the room. Like that's what we're all about. It's like I'm I'm here to help you answer any questions and stuff, but it's cool when you start seeing kids coaching other kids or just like, yeah, when you when you start seeing them pass it along to each other, um, and or just like, because it's it clicks for everybody at a certain age, and you can't really tell when it's gonna click. There's always a day like you can see one like one year one wrestler will be like seventh in state or not even placing and then the next year it's just like it clicks and then he's at the top somewhere but what is that through the camaraderie to the confidence because they're yeah. doing the same practice all the time but it's it's it's, it's weird to see right like how they have there's a whole group practicing at the same pace but then one evolves more than the other. What, what is it then? Like, is it? Well, I mean, during the, I mean, so the, say you have 50 kids in a room, they each have a partner, 25 groups, 25, 25 different groups. And you're showing the same technique, but if these kids are all at different levels, each drill looks different each group looks different Damn. because it's just like some kids are just seeing the technique for the first time. Some kids have already mastered it and, and are adding moves to it and continuing to do that. And so it's like, um, I like to, I like to tell my kids that when you see somebody at the top of the podium, look at a weight above or below them, because you're probably going to see his teammate somewhere around there because his workout partner, because you don't, you don't become a national champ by yourself. It's not just like there's never really like one team that just has like one standout guy and that's it. It's typical because this one guy has to have partners throughout the whole week. And so he's going to get everybody he wrestles better if he's the stud. Oh, OK, OK. I, so, I had never seen it that way. But yeah, you're right. And so no matter who he wrestles, he's going to get them better. And then this kid's going to end up getting a little bit better. And then he's going to help the third kid, too. And so then it's like, and so once you get one kid in there, once or or if you get a group of kids that are buying in, it's like that's when it starts. That's when it starts really like getting trajectory because then it's like, okay, now you got three kids that are winning these tournaments, maybe not, and you still have those fifteen that aren't. But now you got three kids, maybe different weight classes. Now they're going to have different partners, and then they're and then they're going to start elevating their partners, and then it's going to start elevating the whole room. Once a little bit of success starts creeping into the room, it's like it's it's contagious. And so then, boom, success starts bringing more success. And so then once one kid starts winning, it's going to it's going to hopefully light a fire under his partner. Be like, OK, like I work out with this kid every day and he's winning these tournaments and I'm not like, what do I need to do? So then, boom, and then it just kind of keeps going. And so it's like it's all about like and as a coach, it's like showing shedding a little light. We call it celebrating success. We celebrate success whenever we can and we uh, we highlight the kids and we let them know. I'm like, and it's like, 
not only did he just win the tournament, but he wins every day in here. And so, like, focus, like, watch what he's doing. Like, watch how this, watch how he trains. Or, like, or like when we're showing a move, we're like, hey, come show this move so that everybody can see. So we have, like, a, that um, validation from, from a peer, peer validation. It's like, he's hitting this move perfect. Now you can, too. And so it's, it's like not only about bringing in good kids, having the good kids buy in and then having, and then having those ones show success as well as spread the message of like what it takes. And so there's so many different levels to it as, as, as far as being a coach, it's, it's, we, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> you know, I had never seen, um, wrestling in that perspective. Um, and it's. I don't know, you know, like you get a new insight to every sport whenever you talk to somebody who's done it, somebody who's yeah. been about it for, you could say most of your life, right? So, oh, shoot. Yeah, I've been on the mat for more of my life than anything else. So. And, and, and it's insane that the new perspective that I get that, again, it's a solo sport, but at the end of the day, too, that there's a lot of people that make you good, mm -hmm. make you successful. And it's... I don't know. It's just so intriguing to see because a lot of times it's like that in, in, in like life. It's like you are part of what your environment is, is who you surround yourself in your environment. So yeah. like, I've never even seen allowed myself to see wrestling like that. But it's yeah, it's just insane. I imagine it's like that in I mean other sports too. I mean, and I, I mean I like I don't know. I like I can imagine like say you have a all state offensive lineman. And then you have a defensive line that you're working on. Whoever you put up against that offensive lineman, if you go up against that, that all-state offensive lineman like every day as a defensive lineman, one day you're going to get by him. And then one, and like one day you're going to be like, damn, I just got past that all-state lineman. And then, and then in the game, that when you're going against somebody that's not an all-state lineman, you're going to blow past them kind of deal. And so it's always like finding like the people that are going to challenge you. You know, and what and we like to say is like, you got to have three different partners. You got to have somebody that you can teach, somebody that will give you an even match, and then somebody that's going to beat you up, and in a good way, like yeah, yeah. in a good way, someone that's going to challenge you. And so you got one guy that's going to make you reassess what you're doing and make you think about like, how could I do this better? How can I do that? You got one guy that's an even match, and so then you can kind of. Uh, use the technique that you know and that you're good at, but nothing's given. It's like, and then the the other guy is one that you can help, you can bring up, and then you can also like work on your techniques and stuff too because uh, it's like you can work on something that you maybe haven't mastered yet because they're a little bit below you in experience level. And so by having all three, it's like, it's like when someone says like, you don't know something until you can teach it. And so if you can get that technique and you can teach it to someone who's a little bit, uh, who's not as advanced as you, then it just ups your credibility and ups your knowledge and ups your confidence. Because now it's like, you just showed somebody else. You just taught somebody else. I know this move back and like forward and backwards. And so then now the confidence is just shot through the roof. And then you just help this other athlete as well. Um, and Roman, to close out the episode, I know we oriented it more around wrestling. There's yeah. a lot of other perspectives you've gotten, but I just kind of wanted to focus around wrestling because yeah. like, that, that's what you've been all about oh, yeah. most of your life. What's the biggest lesson you've learned from the kids or from wrestling overall that has played out in your life? Like, take a second to think about it because, I mean, now you're involved in a lot of other uh uh what's it called um fighting sports mm -hmm. and even what you're trying to do like grow your friend's business and grow with him at, at the same time i feel like the sports aspect of it always leaves like a trace that we keep on using day to day and even the kids that you teach i'm pretty sure that you get inspired oh, yeah. by yeah um gosh there's so that's a loaded question i mean um, they say once you wrestle, everything else is easy. And so I, and like, and that's, that's an interesting one because like physically I can push myself like to limits. I mean, I've always been a very physical person. Mm -hmm. I mean, even once I won state in wrestling, it was kind of like, 
wrestling is my ticket to college. It wasn't like my brain is kind of deal. <laughs> okay. And so like, and, and so it was, uh, I was very much in the physical realm there, but it's also like the mental aspect that it's gotten me is just like wild too. I mean, the mental toughness that you get from giving thousands of hours to a sport and just like, especially a sport as, um, what's the right word? Just as tough and as mentally taxing as wrestling. I mean, like you can't be mentally weak and be good at wrestling. Like it's just not, it's just not part of it. And, um, and then that leads to being mentally tough outside of wrestling and just in life in general. And so, um, wrestling as a sport has just taught, taught me to just one to just be present. I mean, because life is just so fast. And like, if I, I mean, there's so many different things I could have done in my wrestling career. Mm -hmm. And I wish I was just a little bit more present during the whole thing. Um, and then, um, and just being like present and just life in general too, because like, I watch these, like, yeah, I watch these kids kind of, I mean, I've been coaching for six years and again, the first four years I wasn't watching them compete. And so I, I coached kids all the way through high school and didn't get to see them wrestle once Damn. before they went to college. And so that, and so like, it's like, I'm like, man, like, I wish I was more present during that part too. And just like, cause life is just so fast. It's crazy. And I'm trying to like tell these kids that like, and like show these kids that there's more, to, there is more to life than wrestling. And, and there, and like red, but wrestling will teach you a great foundation of what it takes to be good at anything in life. And so that's kind of what I want to show them is that like, because it's crazy. Like, I mean, again, the 99% of the athletes I coach are not going to wrestle at the next level. They're just not. And, but I've met people in my life, older people that have been like, JV wrestling changed my life. And that's when I'm like, whoa. And so then it's like, now it's not really about the, it's not about the best kids in the room that are going to go take national titles. It's not about those kids too. And that's one thing that I like about my wrestling club is that we give the same amount of attention to the state champ as we do to the kid that might be JV that might never see varsity. And it's cool because when I was growing up, that didn't happen. It wasn't, it wasn't like the worst kid on the team or the, the worst kid on the club was, uh, was wrestling with all the state champs. We had a very small, intimate room where I grew up where it was just like all state champs. Damn. And so it was just all like, I mean, the amount of state champs that my little club group that Coach Sam coached is, is wild to kind of see the amount of people that wrestled in college, the amount of people that are coaching now and stuff, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like this down here. And so that's where it's where I'm like, I love the fact that these kids are even just part of the sport, whether it be for a year, whether it be for five years, whether it be for their life. And then I'm just trying to give them the best experience that I can while they're in it. Because if I can give them half of what the road sport of wrestling has given me, then I'd be fulfilled. But I feel like you are fulfilled, though. Like, I feel like wrestling, from what I've heard, it's like, first of all, it's discipline and mental toughness. It's like, and, and it's good to hear that today we're giving opportunity to kids to wrestle at a high level with other high level wrestlers like that might make it or might not make it. But because that also offers them an opportunity in some other career that they yeah. might one day be challenged in. So it's it's like you're breeding success all around. It's, yeah. it's breeding what what's the club called? C2X. C2X. So yep. seeking seeking excellence. Commitment. Right? Commitment, commitment to excellence. Commitment yep. to excellence. So it's like the commitment to excellence isn't necessarily only in the sport, but it's involved and it plays out nearly every day in every single one of our lives. Literally, man. It's yeah. I mean, I take wrestling with me every day and it's not just the scars and the cauliflower ear. Yeah. Um, but it's just yeah, just my my aura how i go about my day the discipline is always there um the mental strength and uh mental toughness is always there too and yeah i mean life is life's tough and 
um, it's good to have those just like hard experiences and under your, in your, in your back pocket that can, you can kind of lean on because wrestling is so tough that like, I mean, I, I go back and I just look like, I look at back at my college days and I'm just like, man, like I am not that tired right now. Like, or I, I just look back and I'm like, man, like I can, whatever, whatever's on my plate today, I can do this because of, I've already done this in the past. Like no matter what it is, but sometimes it's always just, it's like the non-physical stuff that I have a hard time with. Like, yeah, it's like, I, like, that's why I do audio books and stuff because it's like, (laughs) I I can't just sit down and focus on reading. My brain will just start like just exploding, but yeah, it's like, yeah, but physically I'm good. And, and so, yeah, man, it's just, uh. Yeah, and so I try to take everything I can from wrestling and try to just bring as much of the lover and the fighter in me to everything, uh, everything I do, and just try to make shoot make this world a better place. One, one wrestler, one athlete, one business, one person at a time. Roman, again, thank you for pulling up to the podcast. And um, any last remarks you would like to say before we, anybody that you want to shout out before we tune out. Yeah, I just want to shout out C2X for one, uh, being uh, being the most open, beautiful wrestling club I've ever been a part of. I mean, it's it's wild to to know that how big of an impact we're making as a nonprofit in the Carolinas. That's the whole idea is to grow the sport of wrestling while building servant leaders. Okay, and so it's cool that that we're that I'm a part of that. I'm grateful for that whole team. Um, Shout out to Jimmo. Uh, Jimmo is the MMA gym that that I'm that I'm at. Uh, and shout out to Jeff for for welcoming me with open arms there. I'm grateful for all the fighters I've been able to help and that I get to go to in the future. And then I appreciate you for having me on, man. I Thank mean, you. yeah, you provided a serious space to connect, and uh, I'm grateful that I got to share a little bit of my story and hope that someone benefits from this conversation. I appreciate it, and I hope someone does. Um, guys, you've heard Rome's story. Um, if you guys have a comment, uh, you just make sure you guys put it down. Make sure you guys like this video if you stayed this long. I hope you guys did grab something out of it that um, you can use it towards your life. Obviously, we've seen that uh, sports in whatever aspect do play a big part in our lives. Just that today I've learned how much discipline and how involved you have to be in the sport of wrestling <laughs> to really like test your limits daily so again Rome, i appreciate you got yeah. and guys if you like that episode please let us know and uh make sure i catch you guys on the next one Rome, thank you again yeah thank you roaming around <laughs>